Welcome to AP Daily Live Review. This is night two. Uh, and my name is Allison Napier. I am from Tidewater Community College, and I am here to help you get ready for your AP exam, uh, review some uh, information, talk about some skills. And tonight we are going to be working with the homework prompt that I gave you last night. So we're going to revisit that prompt. Uh, but first, let me go ahead and get everything shared. There we go. But first, let me start with uh, this information because I feel like it's uh, important for you guys to have uh, how, how or know how to get us uh, some feedback on the Google form. Uh, here is the link to that below and I get uh, your responses. I get um, you name it. I get it uh, all coming into my uh, results file and I got your those of you that submitted some responses to the question I got those those of you that had some comments on the session I got those so here is the link please get in touch with me and uh, let me know what questions you have um, concerns things like that and I will address your feedback a little bit later tonight uh, we'll also look at some of the claim statements for the slave ship because that seemed to be to be the big winner of the choices that you made for um, answering the prompt that I gave you. Also, this information here is the link to the Google Drive. This is the tiny URL, so this should take you right where you need to go. Hopefully, if not, uh, make sure you let me know uh, and in the feedback form, and uh, I'll make sure I get you a better link to the Google Drive. So let's get started. So first, thanks again to everyone who turned in last night. Uh, those of you who sent in feedback and responses, uh, that was great, really appreciate it. Uh, let's get started with what we're gonna learn in tonight's review, which is uh, in this session, we're going to go over the visual and contextual analysis long FRQ that I gave you for your homework last night. Uh, we'll take a look at all three of the options given with that question. I also wanna talk about some choices that might not work for this prompt um, and, and kind of how do we make a good choice? I think that's something we also need to talk about a little bit. So uh, we'll troubleshoot some images from the image set that popped up in some responses and see if they are viable or do we need to kind of rethink, uh, retool there. So let's review a little bit of what this question expects of you as a student. So the long FRQ is, this one is one of two, visual and contextual analysis. Uh, it is a long essay that assesses your ability to analyze contextual features of a work of art, as well as visual features. No image provided, so make sure whatever you pick, you are uh, familiar with. Make sure you have a good uh, idea of what it looks like in your mind, because there's no image to help you. I think that's why some of you went with the slave ship, because those uh, a lot of you talked about the body parts in the water. And I think that really resonates uh, when you learn that in class. So I, I wonder if that's uh, why so many picked that anyway. Uh, it's if you choose a work outside of the prompt options, right? So you get three, but you can pick anything that works within the parameters of the prompt. Make sure it works with what you're being asked as well as the date range and the geographic area that you have to talk about. So I'll address that again when we kind of review what the prompt wanted you to do. You need to respond with a response that gives an art historically defensible claim. Uh, then you use your visual and contextual evidence to support that claim. You've got to also connect it to the claim, right? Uh, so explain, and then you, you add this, what we call the complexity point, uh, relevant connections, nuance, different views. And I think in most of the responses I got last night, the complexity is where uh, some of them kind of didn't quite develop the essay or some of those responses were not quite fully developed to get to the complexity point. It, it seemed like uh, some students were repackaging what they'd already said when they need to, to say something really new, make a little bit of a new observation and extend that analysis in a little bit of a different direction. So let's look at the example that I gave you, your homework prompt. And for those of you that may have seen uh, some old prompts in your art history classes or any teachers that are watching, uh, this was actually the 
I retooled the FRQ2 from the 2019 exam. Uh, so this was the old, there was an older format of this question, uh, but now this one has been reformatted to work with the new uh, requirements for the visual and contextual analysis. So many artists from later Europe and the Americas, which is 1750 to 1980, right? That's unit four, communicate a social or political statement through their depictions of the natural world. Your job as a student, select and completely identify a work of art from the list or any other relevant work from later Europe and the Americas, uh, again, 1750 to 1980. So you can pick one of the options given, which I'll show you on the next slide. Uh, everything won't fit, of course. And, or you can pick something else. But if you pick another option, it has to come from Europe, later Europe and the Americas, and it has to come from 1750 to 1980. So if you go off um, outside of the CED images or you pick something else from the image set, please make sure you're picking something that fits in chronologically and geographically. All right, so that said, here's kind of the meat of the question. Your job is to explain how an artist communicates a social or political statement through the depiction of the natural world in the work you have selected. So you're talking about nature. Uh, I had, uh, and when we talk about how to make a good choice, uh, we'll talk about uh, so, uh, some of the choices that I was, one of them in particular I was, was a little problematic because you're talking about nature uh, and there was not much nature in the image uh, that was given. So your responsibility to make all of this happen, put your response together, two accurate identifiers for the work beyond what you're given, respond with your art historically defensible claim, support with two examples of evidence. Again, that can be visual and contextual or too visual or too contextual uh, pieces of evidence. Connect the claim to the evidence and then corroborate, qualify, uh, these connections, right? Expand this discussion out into bigger issues of the time. Uh, we talked last night about um, expansion into Caravaggio's larger body of work. Uh, maybe talk about the way it was received by the wider audience uh, or even a specific audience at a specific place. Uh, so we'll see tonight that there's some other ways to get to complexity. And that's the point that's going to be the most elusive. That's, a, that's the highest skill uh, we got really with an 8D for that. So the options you were given uh, were the Oxbow, the Slave Ship, and the Valley of Mexico. And I'm using shortened names uh, just to kind of save time uh, here. And, and certainly you can use um, the whole name if you want, uh, or the abbreviated names just fine. And you don't have to give both the translation in Spanish and the English name if you choose the Valley of Mexico by Velasco. Uh, so before we go any further, I wanna talk about choices for this question. These are the three that you're given. It's always great when you stick with what you're given because obviously these have been selected because they work with the question. But some people like to go off book and that's cool too. Not all choices from unit four will work though. There are other landscapes. We have Starry Night by Van Gogh. We have uh, Mount Saint Victoire by Cezanne. They aren't really good choices because remember, what we've got to do is talk about a social or political statement. Uh, you know, with Van Gogh, we're dealing with personal explorations of color, expressive line. Uh, with Mount Saint Victoire, we see Cezanne kind of looking for that underlying geometry of nature. Uh, so these aren't really addressing larger social or political issues. Uh, I'm not saying they're not addressing artistic issues or aesthetic issues, but they don't really work with this prompt um, as it's written. Now, one or two, no, actually a couple responses last night gave uh, Cara Saint Lazar by Monet, uh, the image of the impressionist image of the train station. And that can be argued as an urban landscape, but uh, it's more of an exploration of the quality of light at different times of day under urban industrial conditions. So while we can talk about it being kind of an urban landscape, it, kind of the broadest parameters of landscape there, uh, again, we've got to talk about a depiction of the natural world. And so we don't see a lot of the natural world in that image. And you can't really argue in the reverse. You can't say, well, 
by showing the train station, uh, he's showing us that uh, we're leaving the natural world behind. That's not what this question is asking you to do. You've got to talk about how the natural world is used to communicate a social or political statement. And so when we talk about Garrison Lazar, he's showing really trains, the locomotives as the main subject, which is um, a, a pushback against that kind of choice of landscape and the use of nature to address a political or social cause. When we compare it to something like the Oxbow, the, or, and, and all of these works, there are signs of civilization present. We have you know, the small figures in Velasco's work. We have uh, the ship and the bodies thrown overboard in the slave trade, I'm sorry, in the slave ship. And of course, in the Oxbow, we have signs of civilization present, but they are minuscule. So again, the lands, we think landscape, we're thinking of about nature dominating uh, what's going on uh, rather than a focus on uh, trains and train stations and architectural structures. So talking about architectural structures, uh, remember we're not talking about a work in a natural setting. So an architectural structure like falling water will not work for this prompt either. So choices matter, choices are important. And so if you're gonna go off list that you're given here, make sure your choice works with the prompt. So let's practice. Let's talk about some works. We're gonna start with the oxbow. And so during the 19th century, we've got this uh, expanse of time where we see landscape painting uh, elevated to this point of national pride. And, and Thomas Cole is leading the Hudson River School of Landscape Painters, which is based in New York. And he is passionately involved in capturing the beauty uh, of American wilderness in the 19th century. Now he's originally from Lancashire, England, and he immigrates to the U.S. in 1818, settles in Philly uh, before moving to Steubenville, Ohio, and then he moves eventually, uh, you know, he moves around a lot. He, he ends up in New York at, at, at one point as well, of course. So in Steubenville, he is on what is kind of considered the the border of the uh, or the edge of the American West, right? The American wilderness. He works at first as a traveling portraitist, uh, but then he, of course, uh, pursues an art edu an education in art in uh, Philadelphia. Two years after he's in Philly, he goes to New York City. He gets interested in landscape painting. And in his landscape works, he seeks to raise the genre of landscape painting and elevate it to the status of, of history painting, which at this time was one of the considered one of the most preeminent types of paintings for artists to create. He wanted a level of respect really similar to that of history painting given to the landscapes that he created. And so to do this, uh, since history paintings often had these moral messages attached, uh, lands, his landscapes also have that kind of morality embedded in them as an undercurrent. So we see his masterwork here from 1836, a view from Mount Holyoke, uh, Northampton, Massachusetts after a thunderstorm, more commonly known as the Oxbow, uh, this image of a recognizable bend in the Connecticut River with political undertones here that are about the topic of westward expansion, which was very widely discussed in the 19th century. He shows us a landscape that's civilized on the right side, which is the eastern part, uh, and untamed on the left, which is the western part. And all of this works as a reference to the ideology of manifest destiny, which at this time was a widely held belief that Americans had this God-given right and obligation to settle the rest of the continent, the Western territory that was still wild and uncivilized. The scholars that have looked at this painting, they, they're falling, they basically there's kind of two sides of an argument to this painting, which uh, makes it a great option for this question uh, because you know for the complexity, you can take the alternate perspective. Scholars, some scholars say that he chooses to do the work this way by splitting it in the in half, giving us a civilized Eastern side that's ordered and productive and useful and a Western side that's wild and untamed. And that uh, he's trying to promote this idea that along with Western expansion of, of this kind of settler civilization, uh, it's gonna be a positive altering of the land. 
Another set of scholars argue that Cole is really questioning the ideology behind the expansion of, you know, American expansion to the West and Manifest Destiny. He's from England, so he's seen the effects of the Industrial Revolution on the English countryside, and he has concerns that the push westward will ruin uh, and ravage the natural beauty of the American landscape. So same painting, two different interpretations or two different reads on it. He includes a small self-portrait of himself in the foreground. And he's pausing in the middle of the painting, looking out at us, at the viewer, engaging us, trying to bring us into the beauty of the work, as well as this pretty hot topic of the time and, and make us part of the discussion. So let's get started with how we might answer this prompt. OK, we always start with our identifiers. So you're given the title in the prompt. Any two of these will work. Um, the name of the artist. Uh, Thomas Cole or just Cole, can't just use Thomas, we don't know which Thomas you're talking about. Uh, we have uh, Romanticism, Hudson River School, United States, any of those would work, um, but only one, right? So you can't say United States Romanticism and get the identifier. We're talking about one from culture and artist or one from culture and materials. Uh, and then the date range. Now I had a question in the feedback about dates. And you'll see here that um, 1830s works, early 19th century, first half of the 19th century. So if dates are a little challenging for you, you may want to figure out a way to uh, kind of soften um, the param soften the edges. I don't know how else to say that. When I used to teach uh, my students about dates, I told them to think of early, middle, and late century and kind of divide between zero to 33, 34 to 67, uh, 68 to next to 99. Uh, and so that, you know, those kind of date ranges will work. Uh, sometimes there's a cushion between, uh, they'll give you 50 years on either side. Uh, I didn't put that in here because Again, I didn't want to tell you that, and then that wasn't a, an option for this question. It just depends on the question and the images we're talking about as to how much flexibility they might give you on either side of the date you give. Uh, so again, if, you, if you're worried about learning 1836 specifically, maybe consider dealing with you know, early 19th century or first half of the 19th century and make it a little easier for yourself. So let's make a claim statement. Uh, so he's again, he's using the oxbow to support the belief of manifest destiny. Remember, we've got to talk about the natural world and how it's asserting a social or political agenda. So we can talk about manifest destiny. We can talk about on the other side of the argument um, that he has concerns about the rapid development of the you know, of America's um, civilization and, and what it means for natural resources and the landscape. We can also talk about a sense of American pride in the landscape, this idea of creating a unique American identity. 1836, we're only about 60 years out from independence. So we're still kind of feeling our way out as a nation, and we're looking for symbols of uh, what it means to be American. And so kind of embracing our landscape and, and feeling proud about the beauty of our country was another way that this painting uh, promotes or, or connects political social issue to nature. Time for some evidence. Um, so we can talk about the small self portrait within this very expansive natural scene uh, and Cole is a witness to uh, nature. We can talk about the high vantage point and the panoramic view of the landscape with the mountains and the trees, uh, this large size canvas that is intentional, uh, this choice of size to kind of channel that uh, history painting vibe. We can talk about a well-known location, this bend in the Connecticut River that the artist saw firsthand. Uh, we can talk about the division of the composition into two halves. That's what a lot of the responses talked about, the, you know, the civilized side versus the uncivilized side. Uh, the weather conditions uh, that are present, the dark and stormy side, um, kind of on that uncivilized, untamed side, while sunny and calm on the other where civilization has taken root. Uh, so we have these options here for visual evidence. For contextual evidence, we can certainly talk about it being uh, a, rom a romantic work. We, you know, you may have even used it as an identifier of romanticism, but that landscape painters are glorifying, you know, nature in order to 
deal with the political values of a place and time. Um, these images of landscapes, seascapes, other visions of traditional beauty. I mean, connecting this work to romanticism certainly connects it to the time period in which it was created. Other options, uh, we can talk about the support for our God-given divine right of manifest destiny, uh, that we are obligated to move west and settle, or this idea of the unique beauty of America uh, that he observes as an immigrant from another country. Now remember, it's not enough just to give the evidence. We got to connect things together, and we can talk about the self-portrait that's here, right? Where Cole uses this self-portrait to kind of ask for our participation in this discussion. What's the future of America? What does it mean? This large size canvas again, which kind of fuels these moral interpretations because it reminds us of history painting. His choice to talk about a well-known location. Uh, giving us the kind of lush, untamed forest, as well as domesticated land. Again, this kind of positive endorsement of Western, Western, goodness, westward expansion. There we go. Uh, and then this also idea that the storm on the left might be kind of the other side of the argument that just the destructive forces of civilization encroaching on uh, American landscape. A couple more ways to connect. We can talk about the heightening of aesthetic qualities of landscape to create that sense of national pride and identity. And then again, we can also talk about Cole's understanding of the destructive potential of development, industrialization, and his idea of trying to caution the audience about expanding too fast, misusing the land, and what can happen as a result. Now, for the complexity point, you'll see that I wrote with a little asterisk, it really depends on which side of the argument you've argued as to which is going to work. Uh, so if you argue that he is pro-expansion, pro-manifest destiny, then for your complexity point, you can provide that alternate view in, in newer scholarship that uh, the Oxbow was a warning against the destructive forces of encroaching civilization. If you take the other side of the argument, right, um, that Cole was anti-expansion, he was against Manifest Destiny, then you can provide the alternate view that the Oxbow has been interpreted as a positive endorsement of this westward expansion uh, and the fulfillment of our God-given right to settle sea to, sea to shining sea. So again, this is a great example of how if you, you know, when you getting these primary sources and secondary sources in your classes and your, your teachers are teaching you about different interpretations of works, uh, you know, which is skill number seven. Uh, this is a great way to kind of, if you know two, then you can certainly play them against each other, uh, you know, to develop a stronger argument and make it more complex and corroborate what you've previously said with a diverse view. So let's look at option two. Whoops, we need this one first, sorry. Uh, this is one of Turner's most celebrated works, uh, The Slave Ship, which demonstrates the artist's fascination with this kind of violence, uh, human and, and elemental violence. It's based on an 18th century poem that described a slave ship caught in a typhoon. It's also based on the true story of the Zong, which was a British ship uh, whose captain had thrown the sick and dying enslaved people overboard in 1781 in order to collect insurance money. Uh, the deal was if you had slave, enslaved people that got sick and died at sea uh, and you brought them into port, you did not get paid insurance for them, but if they fell overboard uh, then uh, or were lost at sea, then you got the insurance money on them. I know, horrible, right? So Turner captures the horror of the event, the terrifying power of nature, the atrocities of the slave trade with this canvas full of hot churning color and light that brings sea and sky kind of together. We can't really tell where one starts and the other ends. Now, in the foreground, he shows us images of body parts and shackles, and this is in, you know, this kind of idea of the, of the bodies that have been thrown overboard, uh, and this is in conjunction with a feeding frenzy that we see here as well uh, that indicates the fate of those enslaved bodies thrown overboard, and so he's using a powerful painting 
to communicate his stance against the greed of individuals and institutions who are directly profiting from the inhumanity of the slave trade, also bringing to aspect other light or bringing to light other aspects of this horrifying and dehumanizing practice. And notice again, when we talk about the landscape, I mean, we have some human elements in there, right? We have the body parts, we have the ship, which is in the distance. Uh, but again, this is really a focus on the sea and the sky and the power of nature. And so I want to just make sure, you know, when you're making your choices, uh, think about what will work with your prompt. All right, so two identifiers. Uh, again, any two of these together will work. Remember, you've got it, you've given, you've been given this work in the prompt, so you've got to have two in addition to what you've been given. You need to develop an art historically defensible claim. So we can talk about in the slave ship, Turner uh, expressing his view slavery is horrific uh, and, and a dehumanizing practice. Uh, also, he's using this work to communicate his stance about the greed of the individuals and the institutions uh, that profit from the slave trade. And I'm going to show you a couple that came in in the feedback, and I want to kind of work through these and, and address some, some, some that work, some that I think need a little bit more and could work. So the artist uses the sublime nature of the ocean to depict the problems of slavery. I think that as a claim statement, uh, that's okay, I think that um, it could be strengthened by identifying uh, maybe the inhumanity of slavery. A uh, problem is a little generic, but I think this would work and it would get the point. For the second one, in his painting, Turner communicates his belief that slavery is a cruel system of labor uh, through the depiction of the natural world. I think that's great. In summary, so this one actually came later in an essay, right? Uh, and and that, that happens. Sometimes you're writing and, and you would just assert that claim at the end to kind of say, and, and this is what I, I think, and I've backed it all up. Uh, in summary, Turner displays the evil of slavery in the realm of nature in order to embed a sense of opposition to chattel slavery into the viewer subconsciously. So it talks about the use of nature, right? Um, to, to kind of display the evil and depict his sense of opposition. Now, the last one, this one, I think, uh, needs a little bit of something. And, and the first one, the sublime nature, I think it's this use of sublime that needs to be fleshed out a little better in both of them, and it would strengthen both of them. So the artwork is showing the horror of slavery, <coughs> excuse me, through the use of the sublime. I don't feel that's specific enough. And I want to address this term sublime. So the sublime is defined really as having a quality of greatness, magnitude, intensity, and it can be physical, metaphysical, moral, aesthetic, spiritual, and it can focus on things other than nature. So I think using sublime here by itself, it needs a little bit of work here in the last one. The sublime nature of the ocean, okay. The use of the sublime, I'd like to see something announced, you know, something going Sublime is an adjective with a noun that it describes there, because we can talk about sublime in literary criticism, uh, about emotion and spirit in literature, uh, you know, other themes of the supernatural that work in with the sublime uh, that we get from Homer and Dante and Milton and Shakespeare and Byron and Mary Shelley. Uh, so when you're using sublime by itself, I think it needs a little bit more qualification. So I think this is a good start to a claim statement, but I think it just needs a little bit more to bump it up. Okay, so let's talk some evidence. You can talk about Turner's paint application, right? The strong contrast that he's using as he applies the paint to the different portions of the canvas. The limbs and the are very highly detailed and emphasized. He wants you to see those shackles. He wants you to see the marine life consuming the bodies. Uh, the ship is subordinated to the back on the left. And if you look over to the sun and the cloud, you see a very heavy accumulation of paint kind of clumped on the canvas, which adds to the sense of chaos and spontaneity. Clarity gets exchanged here for really an expressive, very painterly execution. And so these violent techniques are matched with a turbulent subject matter, which is, makes it a great pairing. 
The painting is indistinct. It has these hazy atmospheric qualities. Uh, there's a strong value contrast between the darker storm and the water and the, and the brighter setting sun. Uh, we can talk about the wild brush strokes, the gestural application of paint that give this expressive quality to the seascape. Uh, the ship looks as if it's going to turn over, right? It's going to capsize in these violent waves. The carnage in the, of, in the water, body parts, hands, legs, sometimes in chains and shackles, all pushed to the foreground with these sharks and sea creatures. Uh, all of those, you know, certainly very viable vi uh, visual evidence that could be talked about. For contextual evidence, uh, this is again an, an example of romanticism. Uh, so you can certainly talk about the style in which it's created and the time period in which um, artists were working. Uh, talk a little bit about romanticism as contextual evidence. You can talk about Turner, Turner's own kind of career in, in its context. Turner is very knowledgeable about art history. And throughout his career, he honors and emulates famous artists like Titian and Rubens. But at the same time, he's seeking new visual experiences, uh, which we can certainly see in his application of paint. And this causes him to take an interest in contemporary events and modern technologies. He also seeks to shed light on the inhumane practices of slavery and was influenced by the horrific event of the Zog, of, of the Zog um, when the captain, again, sought to collect that insurance money by throwing sick and dying slaves overboard during a storm. And so because insurance companies would only compensate for slaves lost at sea and not those who died on board, uh, again, that kind of inhumanity of not even of not even giving someone the right of a decent burial, uh, throwing them over to be food for the marine life, uh, all of that can, can can tie in with the contextual. Got to connect evidence to claim. So we have an ongoing storm, gestural brush strokes, the vibrant colors. If we're dealing with all of that visual evidence, they create that frenzied sense the evil intentions of the captain and really reinforce Turner's belief that the slavers should be punished, right? Uh, we are hope we're, we're rooting for that ship, um, you know, to maybe capsize because we think that what's going on is so horrible uh, and that people that are, you know, doing these acts shouldn't, shouldn't be allowed to uh, do this. Body parts and chains in the water reinforce, again, the idea on the cruel and inhumane practice of throwing the slaves overboard the enslaved persons overboard as they're dying to collect that insurance money, the greed of the slavers, uh, all, you know, all of that kind of being doubled down on uh, in that aspect of the painting. He also chooses to show us a recent event with this seascape uh, and the subject matter showing his desire to, again, shed light on the inhumanity of slavery and his belief that the slave trade needs to be abolished. So we've identified We've made our claim statement, we've selected our evidence, we've connected the evidence and the claim together. And now we need to expand it outward, right? So in the last one, we took an alternate point of view and talked about, um, talked about that for that complexity point. And like I said, in a lot of the samples I was getting, I, I felt like people were just kind of repackaging what they'd already said. They weren't saying anything new for that complexity point. And that's something you really need to do. So Turner intended, you know, if we want to talk about that kind of nuance or, uh, you know, a little bit of a, a broader discussion of this actual work's context, Turner intended to use this painting to support the British Anti-Slavery Conference, which was being held in 1840. Slavery was abolished in Britain in 1833, in France in 1848, but in America, not yet, right? We know that uh, that will be one of the major causes of the Civil War in the 1860s. So this conference, this British Anti-Slavery Conference met at the same time that the Royal Academy show was going on where Turner displayed this work. And he was hoping that attendees of the conference, specifically Prince Albert, uh, would see this and that they would be affected by this and, and want to kind of, um, you know, again, push for the abolition, push the United States, push America to abolish this horrible practice. Something else we can talk about is Turner's legacy. We can, we can kind of bring this forward. Uh, the, this painting, like a lot of others by Turner, really split contemporary opinions. So we can talk about critical review of this at the time. Um, 
as well as the legacy, which we'll talk about in just a second, uh, it came under attack by a lot of critics. Now, Ruskin will call him the father of modern art, but a lot of people did not like this swirling, frothy color and lack of definition. Turner's reputation has strengthened considerably since the mid-19th century. And in fact, uh, the Turner Prize was named in his honor. And uh, he's also been commemorated on the reverse of a 20 pound banknote. Uh, he's considered one of Britain's, uh, again, fathers of modern art and this most prestigious contemporary art prize uh, has been adapted or, or, or created uh, under his name. So we have this whole group of artists uh, that will also adopt and adapt and, and look to him as an inspiration. Uh, with his bold expressive techniques, he will be very influential for the French Impressionists who will admire his application of paint as well as his way of interrogating the, the presence of light. Uh, he'll also be influential with the abstract expressionists who were uh, influenced directly and, and indirectly by Turner's handling of paint and his engagement with the sublime as subject matter. So any of those would get you to complexity because you're taking your discussion and adding another layer to it. You're taking it in a new direction. All right, last option. Um, this is the Valley of Mexico, which in the 19th century was a striking geographic area and lots of nationalistic pull for the citizens of newly formed independent Mexico. Uh, so we see the site as both the historic, um, the, the historic city of Tenochtitlan uh, by the Aztecs, uh, or of the Aztecs and the Mexica, and then later becomes Mexico City. Uh, this, we see this expansive valley cradling a growing urban area that really becomes synonymous with Mexico itself. Jose Maria Velasco was a painter who made Mexican geography a national symbol of identity through his paintings. Uh, again, this idea of a new nation of Mexico, they're looking for symbols uh, patriotic symbols, national pride, um, things that they can embrace and be proud of after hundreds of years of Spanish colonialism. And so it's really kind of a question, you know, what does it mean to all of a sudden be Mexican or be Peruvian uh, once, you know, we have all these independence movements. So he was one of the most popular artists of the time and got a lot of awards in his time, as well as had a pretty international reputation. This is considered his masterpiece. And he created seven different versions of this view, faithfully depicting the valley's terrain, uh, its sweeping panorama, different sites that are related directly to important events in Mexican history and mythology, native flora and fauna, all of those are present here. Now we do have a human element, but remember it's small, the focus is on the landscape. And so in this landscape, we see very specific sites referenced. Um, in the background, we can see the receding waters of Lake Texcoco, the contours of Mexico City, uh, again, which the city founded in, as the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan in 1325 in the middle of this lake. We see the white peaks dominating the vistas that are Popocatapetl and Iztachicuato, I can't ever say this one, Iztachicuato, the volcanoes that prior to the arrival of the Spanish in 1519 were main characters in a legend of an ill-fated love story uh, and so had a lot of pre-Columbian importance as well as, you know, the sense of a national geographic marker. Uh, we also see the Basilica of Guadalupe, this very small, unassuming hill that was a very important sacred colonial site where the Virgin of Guadalupe appears to the indigenous um, Juan Diego in 1531. And so Velasco paints all of these uh, very important national symbols in here, as well as these figures wearing uniquely Mexican dress, influenced by indigenous heritage and folkloric heritage. And all of this transforms this painting into a, you know, from a, just a documentation of a site into a metaphor that is significant for national identity in Mexico. So we need to identify, we were given this one on the list. So any two additional identifiers will work. I'll give you a second to take a look at those. Next, we establish our claim. So 
the Valley of Mexico asserting uh, that Mexican identity is unique, right? They've got all these distinctive historical and, and sites of national pride that he's showing us. Uh, he's carrying on this tradition of nationalist subject matter by using landscape painting uh, to create something that could be embraced by Mexicans, uh, representing this long history that they have and different periods of that history. We need to support our claim with some evidence. So we see these figures depicted in the foreground in indigenous dress. Um, again, a woman and a ch two children, uh, along with some dogs that are in the foreground. They're far removed from the city, uh, put into the background. We have this monumentality of the image, this open quality that he's giving us here, uh, the specific sites that he includes, uh, Santa Isabel Lake, Mexico City, Tepayac Hill, uh, Popocatapetl, Iztachihuatl volcanoes. Uh, we can talk about any of those as being present as part of visual evidence. We also see a rainstorm in the background that's receding away from Mexico City, indicating that Mexico's dark days are over. Uh, Mexico is now in a new period of modern peace and prosperity, uh, which was something that was being espoused by its current president. Again, for contextual evidence, we can talk about it being a work of romanticism. Uh, this is, we've seen this for each of these images. We can talk about uh, after the 1821 War of Independence from Spain, that Mexico is seeking to establish its identity through artistic endeavor to, endeavors, and that there's a development of a national landscape painting that's part of the dictator Lopez de Santa Ana's efforts to reestablish an art academy, right? There were decades of neglect uh, after um, the actual formation of Mexico as an independent nation. And so this kind of re revive, revitalizing of the academy where Velasco will actually train as an artist, uh, very important in establishing landscape painting and promoting something called uh, lo mexicano, mexicanidad, Mexicanness, right? What does it mean to be Mexican? So we have this image um, of patriotism, a message of patriotism associated with recent Mexican history, uh, as well as its historical past. Connecting claim to evidence. Uh, again, we have panoramic vistas, artistic license taken by Velasco that allows him to bring in a couple of these very important sites. So it, this is really an idealized portrayal of a Mexican landscape. Uh, this imagery he's choosing gives an opportunity to highlight the patriotism, the symbols of patriotism for this new nation, this newly independent society, and especially its embrace of indigenous roots as part of this, or this, this integral part of Mexican identity. Again, the rainstorm in the background, um, of course, we can, we can also factor that into the discussion um, and, and explain, you know, kind of how this kind of passing of the Spanish epoch into this new Mexican nation. We can certainly talk about the indigenous garments, again, connecting that to that, that iconography, that national iconography to what it means to be Mexican, to Mexican cultural heritage. We can also talk about the Basilica of Guadalupe, uh, the Virgin of Guadalupe, who we'll talk about tomorrow night, uh, a very important religious figure uh, in Mexico in the Americas. She is the patroness of the Americas. Uh, she is the protectress of unborn children. She is considered the patron saint of indigenous peoples. And so by tying in this site, uh, he's speaking directly to something that is unique to Mexico, unique to Mexican religion or Mexican Catholicism, uh, and tying all of that in uh, with this sense of the new na national identity. Velasco lived here, right? So I think that that's one of the things that when we start thinking about complexity, uh, I think you could bring in an argument about how he lived here. He, his home was actually located at the foot of the small hill in the middle of the canvas. And he was painting not only um, this idea of something for Mexico uh, and for Mexican identity, but a very personal site for himself. 
and, and this idea that he paints seven canvases, seven, paints the site seven times and what that means as an artist with a larger body of work, uh, doing all of these pieces and really trying to create a sense of Mexican identity as well as something very personal. Now his landscape, something else we can talk about uh, are that these symbols of the nation that he's creating actually are used in world fairs, which is where the whole world comes together to share advances in art and science and, and all sorts of technology. And so this was the Mexico that was being displayed for the rest of the international community. So you have this union of kind of romantic sensibilities coming out of Europe, historical allegory, and these compositions win him important recognition at Chicago's World Fair, Paris World Fair, and Philadelphia World Fair in the late 19th century. He's also exploring that romantic relationship between human beings and scenery. And so these indigenous peoples are that are present um, are in transit from city to country. They're showing us this romantic yet very difficult socioeconomic relationship between the people and their ancestral land as they're trying to navigate what it means to be Mexican, what it means to modernize, and what it means to have a sense of national identity. And then again, this idea uh, that as he explores these relationships, he's channeling some things that we've seen in uh, other German romantic painters, Caspar David Friedrich, uh, Joseph Anton Koch. Uh, so this idea of man versus nature, how does man fit into nature, national pride, romantic poetry of, of this kind of visual creation, all of those could work in ways to expand into a larger complexity point. Okay, so what should we take away from all of this? A quick review, free response question two, you're working with visual and contextual features, you have no image, uh, you can choose one of the options on the list, you can also go off list, but make sure it works with the prompt. Your claim and thesis statement should be simple, it should be its own sentence, it's got to do more than restate the prompt, you've got to explain how nature is being used to create a social or political statement. You need evidence two pieces of visual, two pieces of contextual, one of each, then you need to connect that evidence to your claim or thesis statement. And then finally, that complex understanding that you can get from uh, corroborating what you're talking about by showing another side of the story and multiple perspectives like we saw with the Oxbow. Uh, we can talk about you know, this analyzing of different variables like all of these sites in the Velasco work and connect it to the World's Fair and the national identity that is being produced there for not only Mexican uh, identity, the Mexicans themselves, but for the greater international community. Uh, we can talk about Turner and his intended audience. You know, this kind of idea of what kind of responses are being elicited with these works are all ways to tie in um, that kind of greater uh, argument that we're looking for for the complexity point. So remember. After you do your essay, go back and take the list. When you talk about that complexity point, make sure you're not just restating everything you've already stated. You're not just repackaging it and, and handing it back to us in another, you know, another differently phrased sentence or a couple sentences. Say something new, you know, expand outward. Think about broader discussions. And I think that'll help you kind of get where you need to be with the complexity point. All right, so don't forget, you can contact me, uh, send me your feedback through the URL. No homework tonight, but I will have one for you tomorrow night. Uh, really nothing new in the Google Drive tonight, but here is the link in case you wanted to look at any of the things um, that I talked about last night. And that is it for night two. Uh, thanks again for coming, for your time. I really enjoy uh, sharing this information with you. I hope I'm helping you out. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to talking to you uh, again tomorrow night. And uh, so I'll look at your feedback. I'll see what else I can address for you, what other questions you have. And so I guess for now, uh, stay happy and healthy art historians and good luck with your studying. See you tomorrow. <laughs>